several OK, we'll just break out of that story there because the Greens have just stepped up for a media conference. This is in the wake of the government's drought package. That would go to do this. Obama, for example, President Obama, has just put bushfires into their disaster fund in the United States, recognising that this is part of global warming and they're going to have to have the dollars to respond to it. In Australia, we've got, had a round table of people, business people, leaders in the community saying we need a national disaster resilience advisor, we need a fund, we need to be anticipating. Every dollar you spend anticipating disaster saves you three dollars in terms of what you'll have to spend after the event. So our main criticism is that Tony Abbott and Barnaby Joyce do not understand drought and that they're being cruel to farmers in the longer term by refusing to acknowledge the science of global warming and the fact that we will not be able to farm in the same ways, in the same places, with the same products as we have always done. Do the world is changing. Do you think in the long term places like Broken Hill and Burke and Longreach, they shouldn't be farming there at all? They are just going to be the droughted areas, farmers shouldn't be there. Well, one of the huge risks of global warming is that it's going to transform parts of Australia and we know that there is no uniformity about increased temperatures. Uh, you're not going to just have a uniform two degrees. In some places you will have less, in some places you could have four or five that, degrees. These farmers should move on from these areas? I'm not saying farmers should move on from areas. I'm saying that we need to run the, the climate maps over the areas and look at risk management into the future and find what else farmers could be doing. It might go to stocking rates, for example. It might go to uh, the various breeds that um, farmers are uh, basically producing with. So it depends entirely on what's possible into the future. But you can't pretend it's business as usual. Rachel, do you want to just comment on that? There are other. We need. That's why we need to be invest, investing in uh, research and development, which is why we are st so strongly supportive of investment in research and development. Unless we're ahead of the game, unless we're doing that research now, we are not going to be prepared for what these areas will look like into the future. So it's a matter of assisting farmers and growers to transition to a new approach to climate, to new crops, to new ways of managing the landscape. At the moment, the government is not investing sufficiently in R&D either, so that's the other arm of what we need to be doing so to look at this I, new future. What if I'm a sheep farmer in, in Burke and I don't want to transition to a, a crop or a, you know, camels or you know, buffalo or any other sort of types of herds? Well, basically on, on that, one of the things that uh, if you're a sheep farmer in Burke, you might consider having a solar farm, for example. Renewable energy is a major opportunity for rural and regional Australia. It's a new crop in the rotation. It literally is. And any attack on the renewable energy target is an attack on jobs and investment in rural and regional Australia. But farmers are absolutely fantastic at adapting. You only have to look at the way they have changed breeds, farming practices over recent years to see that once they understand what the risk management is into the future, where the new markets are, what other product they might be able to produce, they get onto it pretty smartly. That's why I say it is cruel to them to go around saying this is a drought, it will just go back to normal, we'll just get you back to doing what you do before. The best way of helping them is to say let's actually anticipate what might happen and work out how you might best respond to that on your property. Senator Mill, one of, one of the um, tools that you possibly are talking about, ways of farming in the future that's been identified by farm groups is uh, genetically modified crops or biotechnology. Australia's chief scientist has uh, supported the science there. Farm groups support the science and it's got bipartisan support here in Canberra from the major parties to explore those technologies and invest R&D. How can the Greens continue to oppose uh, GMs in light of what you're saying here, given that crops can grow on more restricted soils and, and uh, climatic conditions if that technology is allowed to? run its full course. Well, I draw your attention to a case that's on in Western Australia at the moment, but Rachel, would you like just to respond to that? In terms of Mr Marsh's, uh, there are significant issues with uh, GMOs that the industry likes to paste over that, that are in fact very significant. They haven't proven to become commercial to in fact fulfil the promises that they're, that they're making. Um, in addition, there's many markets around the world that don't want genetically modified crops and they're rejecting them. So it's in fact in farmers' interests to be 
um, able to uh, produce conventional crops so they can meet um, those markets. But as yet, they are yet to meet those promises. There's also extreme concerns about then who owns the seeds. So you go and talk to farmers overseas and look at the ones that are getting into trouble for uh, growing uh, seeds that are owned by uh, the companies that produce them. So there's a, a lot of issues with GMOs that in fact aren't being fully discussed and need to be canvassed. And I'd also take you back to look at the issues in the states. There are, many, there are a number of states that still have moratoriums um, in place. Thanks very much, everyone. OK, we'll leave that there. That was the Greens leader, Christine Milne and Rachel Seward as well, commenting there on that drought package that we heard from the Prime Minister and the Agriculture Minister just in the last hour.